The Crossover, Bridging Gaps Between Jews and Christians. In these days of violent religious and ethnic conflict, the Judeo-Christian foundations of our country need to be strengthened by uniting Jews and Christians on their commonalities and with their God. The Crossover brings intriguing, dramatic testimonies and timely topics with a variety of guests discussing the Bible, fact or fiction, the Hebraic roots of Christianity, Judaism 101, the Promised Land, Creed and Deed, the Feasts of the Lord, and Never Forget, stories of Jewish and Christian martyrs and their liberators past and present. I'm going to talk now for the next half hour about the five deceptions of Islam. There are many more than five deceptions in Islam, but I want to focus on the five most critical deceptions of Islam. Islam claims it's a religion of love. How many people have heard that? Islam is a religion of love. President George W. Bush even said that. Second deception, Islam is a religion of peace. How many people heard that? George W. Bush said it, Islam is a peaceful religion. <laughs> Third deception, Allah is just another name for God. How many people have heard that one? George W. Bush said that too. Now, by the way, I'm not attacking George W. Bush. I love George W. Bush. I really love George W. Bush. And if I were president of the United States, which praise God I'm not, I would say the same as George W. Bush. Because when you're president of the United States and you have to deal with the pagans and work with them, you cannot attack their religion. Because certain Muslim forces today are part of the coalition on the war against terrorism. In effect, what George W. is doing is he's dividing and conquering. But because I'm not president of the United States and because I'm preaching in Christian churches and messianic groups and even in synagogues, when you're in the house of God, you have to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Amen. Amen. So help me God. The fourth deception, Muslims will say to you, we worship Jesus Christ just like you guys do. That's the fourth deception. And the fifth deception is that the Quran is the divine word of Allah to Muhammad. I want to go back a second to Nancy, this woman in Texas. This woman in Texas drove me crazy. You know why? Because she knew the Bible. I was 37, 38, 39. I was senior editor and translator in the prime minister's office. I was an officer in the Israeli army spokesman's office, but I did not know my own Bible. And this Christian woman, woman this local yokel cowgirl from the, from the hill country of Texas, she knew her Bible. And every time she wrote me a letter, it took me about an hour to research what she quoted to me from the Bible in order to be able to answer her. In 1991, I took a break from my speaking in churches and went to seminary to become a conservative rabbi. And I went to the seminary of the conservative movement. Unfortunately, the seminary of the conservative movement is ultra-left. It's like a born-again Texan from the hill country going to a Methodist seminary in Philadelphia. <laughs> so, or, yeah, or in Dallas. So I did, not, I did not become a rabbi for that reason. But God had a reason for me not to be a rabbi because he didn't want me to be a rabbi of a hundred families in a small pulpit somewhere. God wanted to me, me to be a rabbi to the Christians, to tens of millions of Christians. And in seminary, one of the first things I learned was five verses from the New Testament. Isn't that funny? You go to the Jewish Theological Seminary to become a Jewish rabbi and they teach us verses from the New Testament. The Orthodox would go nuts with that. The Orthodox don't even touch the New Testament. See, because in the, in the Talmud it says if you read any of these non-Jewish works, you know, the pseudo-epigraphy, then, uh, or Apocrypha, any of these books, you get the cooties. <laughs> You're not allowed to touch those books. And I, basically it says in Talmud, anyone who reads the New Testament has no place in the world to come. That's the way the Jewish rabbis in the Talmud think about the New Testament. When I saw these five verses, I realized how wrong the Talmud was, in this sense. And the first verse, again, when we have not 10 hours, I take out the prayer shawl. I see some of you with the prayer shawl. Well, God bless you. And I put on the phylacteries. How many people have seen phylacteries? Okay. And phylacteries are also mentioned in the New Testament together with the prayer shawl. If you open to Matthew 23, verse 5, Jesus says, they make broad their phylacteries and they enlarge the hems of their garments. Now, if you haven't seen those two paraphernalia, you don't know what I'm talking about. But Jesus used those two paraphernalia. So I teach this. And I show and I prove how Jesus used them and why he used them. 
because he was a rabbi, and all rabbis use these things. These uh, prayer shawl and phylacteries have been around for 3,500 years. But the four verses out of the five that changed my life forever were Mark 12, 28 to 31. And for me, these four verses are the most important verses in the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Jesus is teaching Deuteronomy 6, 4, 9, and Leviticus 19, 18. You know, the Jewish people have 613 commandments in the Torah. Jesus focuses on the two most important commandments. The first one is, love the Lord thy God. The second one, love thy fellow as thyself. But Jesus passes a judgment here, a very important judgment, that out of the 613 commandments, the two most important commandments of all, love the Lord thy God, love thy fellow as thyself. And then he says, there are no commandments greater than these two. Now you've got to understand something. Just as I hated Christians for the first 40 years of my life, I also hated the word love. You know why? Because I was from the Vietnam generation. I was from the hippie generation. And for me, the word love aroused associations of drugs, free sex, and anti-Vietnam protests. So I heard the word love, and I was like a porcupine with all my spines up. That word love was a curse for me. And I've come to the conclusion that when Jesus says, love the Lord thy God and love thy fellow as thyself, that these are the two most important commandments, it's because the whole civilization in which we live is based on these two commandments. And if you don't love God, and then if you don't love your fellows yourself, you are working towards the destruction of this civilization. All the order in the world is based on this. All civilizations are based on this. God is the ultimate father and mother of all of us. But we have bio biological parents, and we owe them our love. Parents, at least normal parents, the vast majority of cases, work hard to feed and clothe their children, give them everything they need. And if they're normal parents, which most are, parents want only one thing. You know what that is? To look into the apple of their eye, those little children, and feel the love coming back at them. Isn't that so? You don't expect to bring children to the world to sell them or to make them work in the coal mines or something. You raise these children so that you will work for them and you'll give them everything. And you see, God is the same. God blesses us and blesses us and blesses us. And God only wants one thing from us. What does he want? To, that we love him. Is that asking too much from your children that they should love you? Is God asking too much from us that we should love him? But you know, many times parents give their kids everything and the kids turn out absolutely rotten. You know what an example of that is? The United States of America. This is the greatest country on earth. America is the most blessed country on earth. You have the greatest wealth and prosperity and conveniences and standard of living. And you know what? People don't appreciate what God is saying. When you look at Deuteronomy 8, you have the answer to that. Deuteronomy 8, I'll just give a short summary, but you should read the whole chapter when you go home. Deuteronomy 8, God says, the day will come that your houses will multiply, your flocks, your sheep will multiply, your gold and silver will multiply, and everything that you own will multiply. And at that time, you will raise up your heart against the Lord, and you will say, I did this with my own hands. But then God goes on and says, but it is I, the Lord, who give you the ability, who gives you the ability to attain this wealth. My two sons married two wonderful Jewish girls. One of them is Yemenite. Now, if you know Yemenite, are kind of like Afro. You know, we have in Israel many different Jews from all countries of the world. We now have black also from Ethiopia. Anyway, my son married an almost Afro girl, Yemenite. And I love that girl, and I love her parents, and we are really one. We're always together with her parents. But I felt kind of bad, you know, because usually when a, a whitey marries a dark person, the kids come out with dark eyes, you know. So my grandson, who's now four and a half, has dark eyes, and he's a little more, how should I say, chocolate. <laughs> but that grandson, when I look at him, you know, and he looks at me, there's trouble in the air. And I know something, it taught me a lesson, that God is completely colorblind. God doesn't see ethnic backgrounds. 
He doesn't see your color. He doesn't, he doesn't care if you're white or black or Hispanic or Chinese or Hindu or Arab or whatever. This is the point. All human beings are in his image. And you know, living in Israel, I will tell you something. All too often, we bury our children. They die in wars. They die also from sicknesses and traffic accidents and needless things. What makes parents happy? When your children play together. What makes parents sad? When they hate each other. And they stab each other and they kill each other. You know, kids, sometimes they kill each other, uh, brothers and sisters. We well, want to know something. God looks at all of us in this way. And every human being who dies, whether it be black or white or Hispanic or Hindu or Chinese or whatever, God cries. God sees every child being killed. The problem here is that God gives us all a free choice. And when human beings kill other human beings, God does, cannot really intervene, except maybe for some big time prayer. But the Holocaust was not from God. The Holocaust happened because humans did this to humans. Now, I took out of half an hour, 15 minutes, just to make this point. Jesus says, love the Lord thy God, love thy fellow as thyself. You cannot say you love God if you hate even one human being. We have to love each other, we have to love all human beings, otherwise we hate God, because we're all in God's image. Does God want to see the death of any human being? Does any parent want to see the death of their children? That's how God feels towards us. And again, I have to emphasize, the four most important verses in the whole Bible, love the Lord thy God, love thy fellow as thyself, there are no commandments greater than these two. What do you think about a book that calls itself holy, and if those two verses are not there, what kind of a holy book is that? You see, the Quran, the book of Islam, never says, love the Lord thy God, love thy fellow as thyself. But aren't Muslims loving people? They are loving people. You know why? Not because of their book. They're loving people because they're human beings. Human beings in our faith are created in the image of God. If our God is a God of love, then Muslims, if they're human beings, they're people who have the potential to love. Do German people love? But do Nazis love? No. Do Russians love? But do communists love? No. These are perverse systems which corrupt the goodness and the potential that every human being has. So this is the first deception. Islam is not a religion of love. Islam is a religion of hate. How can it be a religion of love if those two commandments are not in the Quran and they're not in the Hadith? This is a very important biblical question I'm going to ask you now. Does God love the sword? Why does God hate the sword? What's the purpose of the sword? To kill human beings. Human beings are created in the image of? Does God want to see any human being killed? That's why God says in the Bible, throughout the Bible, Never build an altar with iron implements. I don't know if you know the Old Testament. It says never build an altar with iron implements. Iron is an implement of death. Islam, second deception, claims to be a religion of peace. But if you know Arabic, and if there are any Arabs watching this video, ask any Muslim, Islam is called Din Asif. In Arabic, Din Asif means the religion of the sword. Islam is the, you ever see the flag of Saudi Arabia? It says in Arabic letters on a green background, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, and underneath it is a sword. Is that God's flag? Of Islam. Is that there will be no peace on earth until the house of Islam conquers the house of the infidel, until the good guys defeat the bad guys. Isn't it wonderful that the good guys defeat the bad guys? The only problem is we're the bad guys. The Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, the Buddhists, and the blacks are to be slaughtered if they don't convert to Islam. The Islamic system cannot bring peace to earth until everyone's a Muslim or those who refuse to be Muslims are dead. You know what that means? There'll never be peace as long as Islam is around. And you look around the world, you see Islam fighting the Jews. You see Islam fighting the Christians. You see Islam fighting the Hindus. You see his Islam fighting the Buddhists. You see Islam fighting the blacks. And you see Islam fighting Islam. 
I'm going to give you a few examples. Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a country of all five religions. You had Hindus and Buddhists, they were the first. Then came the Jews and the Christians. The Jews and the Christians lived in peace with the Hindus and the Buddhists. And then came the Muslims. Now, the Hindus and Buddhists are pagans. They are to be slaughtered first. Pagans are to be slaughtered immediately. The blacks, the Hindus, the Buddhists are to be slaughtered with no mercy. Now, the Jews and the Christians are respected in Islam. We're the people of the book, right? So they slaughter us second. First, they slaughter the pagans. Then they slaughter the Jews and the Christians. So Afghanistan was a country where first to go were the Hindus and Buddhists, then the Jews and the Christians. And then when there were only Muslims left, you had four different Muslim groups. Pashtuns, were like the Pakistanis. Uzbeks and Tajis, like the border with Russia. And Hazaras, who are like Iranian Shiites. So what did they do for hundreds of years? They kill each other. The country self-destructs, Afghanistan self-destructs, and then who has to come in and pick up the pieces? America. Iraqis, they're free. They've got problems still with the uh, terrorism, the homicide, like in Israel, we have the homicide bombers too. George W. freed the Iraqis. Should we hate the Iraqis or should we love the Iraqis? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who are they? They're Iraqis, the forefathers of the Jews and the Christians. So we'd have to love the Iraqis. Praise God for freeing them. Praise God for George W. Bush. Saddam Hussein was the Hitler of the Islamic world. He killed two million Muslims. Saddam Hussein didn't kill Jews or Christians. He killed Muslims. And yet everybody condemns the United States for freeing the Iraqis from this Adolf Hitler of Islam. Two million Muslims he killed. He killed one million just in this war with Iran. The last example I want to give you, there are many examples, but I'll just give you one. Now, you heard of Algeria? Algeria, just south of France. There are no Hindus or Buddhists. There are no Jews or Christians anymore. And there are no Shiites. Remember the Muslims? The Shiites and the Sunnis are fighting each other. There are no Shiites there. They're only Sunnis, and they're only Algerian. 200,000 have died in the last eight years. Their throats slit and their arms chopped off because they weren't Muslim enough. You see, so Islam is a system that will kill the pagans first, then the Judeo-Christians, and then they kill each other. Adolf Hitler thought he could conquer the earth, he thought he could kill all the Jews. Those are the two psychoses I'm gonna talk about tonight. Now firstly, can any human being conquer the earth? Only the Lord has dominion over the earth, amen? So anyone who thinks he can conquer the earth is psychotic. That was Alexander the Great, the Romans, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin. And there were others too. Can anyone kill all the Jews on the earth? Now, there are two types of people. Either you believe in God or you don't believe in God. If you believe in God, Jeremiah 31, verse 125 says, There will be no more Jews on the face of the earth when the moon, the sun, and the stars stop shining. You know what that means? You better pray for the Jews. Because when the Jews go, the moon, the sun, and the stars go. That means no more world. Now let's say, God forbid, you don't believe in God. Okay? But you know that the Jews are rambunctious. The Jews were scattered all over the earth. If you can't conquer the earth, you can't reach all the Jews to kill them. So anyone who thinks he can kill all the Jews is psychotic. What does Islam believe? Islam believes it's going to conquer the earth, makes it psychotic like Nazism. Islam believes it's going to kill all the Jews, which makes it psychotic like Nazism. But it's even more psychotic than Nazism, because they want to kill two billion Christians. They want to kill one billion Hindus. They want to kill two billion Buddhists, including all the Chinese. Now, I don't know what you know about China. Do you think China's going to sit back while the Muslims slaughter them? Do you think that five billion non-Muslims are going to sit back while one billion slaughter the five billion? That's really super psychotic. Forgive me for saying this, dear brothers and sisters. Islam is not a religion. Islam is a psychosis. Islam is a mental illness. It is a mental state, a, a psychotic state. Now let me ask you if you're Christians. Do you hate people who are sick? Do you hate people who are psychotic? You try to heal them. In this case, the way to heal the Muslims is to witness to them and bring them to the Lord. Bring them to the Lord or they bring you to the sword. 
I don't know if you ever heard of YWAM. I work with YWAM. I work with Women of Glow. I work with Baptist Ministries, Assemblies of God. Any ministry that wants me to teach their missionaries, I give them these five deceptions of Islam. Their religion, their psychosis, is a psychosis of murder. And even homicide, suicide bombings. I don't know if you heard about this or not, but you know, skipping to Israel for a second. Five years ago, in the summer of 2000, there were 3.8 million Palestinians in Israel, in the territories. 3.8. You know how many there are today? You remember Abu Mazen was elected two months ago. They had to have a census. You know how many Palestinians there are today? 2.4. The population went from 3.8 to 2.4. Their population dropped one and a half million people. Why? You can blame the Israelis as much as you want. Arafat did not feed his people. He killed his people. He destroyed his people. And if you cannot work, if you're a Palestinian mother and father and you cannot work, you cannot feed your children. And the Muslim clerics take your children and blow them up on the altar of Molech, excuse me, on the altar of Allah. Yes. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to pick up, you're going to leave. Yes. Now, of course, I pray for peace in the Middle East, but I'm telling you right now, there will never be peace in the Middle East as long as Islam continues to survive as a psychotic system. Right. Our God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? Amen? And it says, how do I know? Because it says seven times in the New Testament. The New Testament confirms and focuses on things that are mentioned hundreds of times in the, in the Old Testament. They're focused in the New Testament. The first gospel, Matthew, the first chapter, the first page, the first words of the New Testament, these are the generations of Jesus Christ. And you have 14 generations and 14 generations and 14 generations. And what do you see in the middle? You see Ishmael? You don't see Ishmael. You see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet, Islam says, it's Ishmael. Hey, wait a second, is God confused here? Is God confused? No. One of the books is wrong. The Quran is wrong. Now, you know that Ishmael was the bigger brother, older brother, and Isaac was the younger brother, but God chose Isaac. Why? Esau was the older brother, but God chose Jacob, not Esau. You know why? Very simple. They were men of the sword. He chose the farmers, and he chose the shepherds. What is one of the name of Jesus? The good? See, because when you're a farmer or a shepherd, you're part of God's creation plan. When you're a man of the sword, you're part of God's destruction plan. You follow what I'm saying? We're talking about good and evil, creation, destruction. Very important chapter, very important verse in the Bible, Genesis 16. Prophetic. The angel of the Lord appears before Hagar. Hagar, if you want to call her that. He says, you're going to have a son. His name is going to be Ishmael. And he's going to be, it says in Hebrew, Pere Adam. Adam means a man in Hebrew. Pere means burro in Spanish. He's going to be a beast. He's going to be a donkey. You ever see a wild donkey kicking in all directions? That's Ishmael. Is that man anointed for the priesthood? But Isaac was. That's why God chose Isaac even though Ishmael was the older one. And I don't have to tell you, a lot of you here have brothers and sisters and family members that nobody wants to hear the name of Jesus Christ or the church or the synagogue or God or the Bible. Do you love them any less? You still love them. You know what? You love them more. Does Jesus love the 99 sheep or the one that got lost? The one that is wild, that's the one you got to love more because that wild one needs the love. So are we to hate Ishmael and Esau? No, we're to love them. And our rabbis teach to love them. But they're not anointed for the service of God. That's why God chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it says about Ishmael, he'll be a wild donkey. Listen carefully. His hand will be against all his brother's hands, meaning war, the sword. And all their hands will be against him. And he will live in the face of his brethren. You know the American slang? Hey man, you're in my face. You better get out of my face. Well, that means war. You, you know that slang. It's from Genesis 16. 
And in chapter 25 of Genesis, it says, and Ishmael died in the face of his brethren. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. He lived in the face of his brethren. He died in the face of his brethren. Remember, Jacob got the blessing instead of Esau. Esau comes to his father, Dad, surely you should bless me. What does is, what is Isaac bless Esau? You'll live by the sword. In Hebrew, al Now that wasn't a blessing. That was a curse. A father says to his son, you will live by the sword. See, Isaac knew he was blessing Jacob. Because when he says to Esau, you'll live by the sword, how could that be a man who would serve God? And you know, remember Peter, when he chops off the ear of the legionnaire, what does Jesus say to him? He who lives by the sword, dies by the sword. So our God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who is supposed to be sacrificed on Mount Moriah, according to Genesis 21? Isaac. Where was he supposed to be sacrificed? Mount Moriah. Where is that? Jerusalem. No. The Muslims say different. The Muslims say, no, it was Ishmael, the chosen son. They have a holiday called Eid al-Adha. Eid al -Adha is the sacrifice of Ishmael. And you know where Abraham was supposed to sacrifice Ishmael? Does anyone know? Was it Jerusalem? Mecca. You want to hear something crazy? Jerusalem is never even mentioned once in the Quran. Mecca is never mentioned once in God's holy Bible. You see, Satan and God do not give each other the benefit of the doubt. You know, Jesus says, either you're for me or you're getting me. There's no compromise. Can you compromise with Satan? Give your finger to Satan, he takes your arm. You take, give him your arm, he takes everything. You know what God says in the Ten Commandments? I am the Lord your God. Second commandment, you shall have no other gods. But Christians who go to bed with the Muslims are doubly guilty because you're denigrating and delegitimizing the divinity of Jesus Christ to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if you go with Ishmael. The Crossover, an award-winning program bridging gaps between Jews and Christians. For your comments, more information on today's or other Crossover programs, or if you would like to support this effort, contact us at 713 639-2888. We want to hear from you.